I'm B.B. Friedberg, and I'm a buyer from Macy's New York. Um, I happen to buy women's clothing, but a buyer's job is really not that different, no matter what you buy. The main issue is selecting merchandise based on style and fashion, price, and quantity. In my particular case, I work six months to a year in advance. I buy for winter in the spring and for spring in the fall. Hello, how are you? Good, how are you? Fine, thank you. You ready? Yes. Okay. We're at Norma Kamali now. We're looking at a spring line, although we are now in the month of October. These skirts look great layered with like running pants underneath. What's been real good has been the knicker. None of this merchandise has been made yet, only the preliminary samples. And based upon my order and other orders, they will manufacture the merchandise. I think it's much easier. Um, the three quarter or the knicker? The, the knicker. The knicker? They don't have to think about it. I happen to deal with very high fashion merchandise and it's very changeable. I cannot predict exactly what will sell six months ahead, so I must be very cautious in my projections. Is that one of your best number one tops? That is. That and the sweatshirt top? That, the shoulder pad t-shirt, the turtleneck that I've got on. That's a real good idea. You predict what's going to be going on mainly by taking an educated guess. I often don't buy what I like myself. A lot of it is based on things I know sell every year in terms of color, or shape, or style. A lot of it is just watching people on the street, seeing what people actually wear. The off the shoulder, wonderful. which is gorgeous. And this looks great. Since this is that sophisticated look I was telling you about. Here, here, and the peplum jacket. So you can go to work. Some of the new dresses. The swoop. Well, I think... We'll continue with all the bodies we've done. Right. The, raw, the short raw skirt. Right. The pop. The, the th you say the knicker has been stronger than the three-quarter pop. Yeah. So I will do both. Okay, for the colors, I think I'll continue with the gray heather. Right. I'll do the pale olive and pumpkin and use cream as the accent rather than white. Yeah, I think it's softer. It and then some red still. Oh, and your Emily cute. has on our convertible bloomer. And this, when you pull the drawstring at the bottom, the convertible bloomer pulls out into a culotte skirt, so it gives a totally different look. It's re I love it. It's really cute. Is anyone yeah, it's doing very an ad versatile. On it? I like this very much. Have you committed to an ad no. on it yet for no. New York? No. Well, I'd like Macy's to do the first ad. Oh, great. I Please. love it. And Pat has on our Poots pant. With Advertising is extremely important because we have a lot of new innovative merchandise a lot of the time and it's important to expose it to the customer. Bloomer so I think we should here. do a two-figure ad. Okay. We'll do the pants yeah. oh, that'd be wonderful. Yeah. and the bloomer. Now this is terrific. And the colors here play so well against each other. Then the version of the brave, pants very brave the to do orange. Yeah. Most people, most people are afraid of it. I love, I love it. Yeah, yeah. I, I hope the work. customer likes it. Yeah, I, that's what I was about. You can always make a mistake on color. For instance, orange is a notorious color for being a disaster at retail. Although I'll buy it, I'll buy it very sparingly. I don't think it will be any different this spring. When I go to buy merchandise, I like to look at the entire range of clothing. Exactly. The first time I go, I check off the numbers I like, and then I go back subsequently and, and just review my notes and look at the merchandise again, just to make it clear in my mind how I want to put the order together. Well, my silk business is awful. I know. So I, yeah. But it is always much better after a bad season, because we analyze the selling of the silk, and actually we're selling as many pieces as we sold last year, it's just that people bought too many this year. Tom, do you think we could share? The gentleman in Fenrite and Manson was making comments based on an audience that goes across the country. I, on the other hand, have sales figures right in front of me that indicate that I should do things contrary to what the rest of the nation might be doing. Do you not feel that there may be a duplication, that these two silhouettes may um, split sales with one another? No. Why not? Because a much more conservative woman would right. wear the button shoulder yes, versus the other. I understand that. The most fun the part of being a buyer is that the job is totally within your own hands to make or destroy. This is my department. And it's fun to see that you bought something and you can sell $10,000 worth of it in a day. Hello, Kathy. Hi, Vivi. How are you? Is business good? Oh, it's been wonderful all yes? day. Okay. Yes, it hasn't stopped. We got in some more of these tops. Many people think that to become a buyer, you should work in a retail situation 
in high school and in college, which I do think is a good idea because it sort of toughens you to the reality, those non-glamorous parts of it. Um, I, I fell into retailing by mistake, really. I'd um, gone to college and I was supposed to go on to medical school and was a bit ambivalent about it. And I only had two marketable skills. Either one was to work in a lab and the other was to work in a store because I'd worked in my mother's store growing up. So when I moved to New York and I needed to work and I started working in retailing just by default and I ended up never going to medical school and staying at Macy's. It's not exactly a nine-to-five job. Often on Wednesday evenings, you'll find me working in the windows until two or three in the morning. My position is window display director. I direct basically what's going on in the windows, producing a total look that will sell merchandise. I work at Saks Fifth Avenue in New York, one of the most prestigious stores in the world. And the challenge of my job is to come up with a different idea each week and to complement the clothes that are being shown. And we'll do one of the fur throws. I mean, we have a couple sculptures that are... You have sculptural work that we become involved in. You come in contact with painters. There's creating our own props at times. There's fashion illustration and a total concept of the art field. This evening's windows are portraying the best of Saks Fifth Avenue. We're going all the way and using, you know, this beautiful furniture and spending extra money to, to make it special. See, what we'll do is we'll do this table here along the back wall. So that's a 12 mannequin. Yep. Two members of the staff that work very close with me are Christique Scoob and our fashion coordinator. And you know what? This would be it. This would fit into a threesome. We can't alternate. And uh, Larry Morton, our stylist, he works very closely with me as far as going over the propping in the windows and the breakdown as far as which mannequins go in which windows and which mannequin is going to be right for the clothes. And let's use this, um, this Maria and bring her down there. So I want to change that arm. Once the store is emptied, we bring everything up to the main floor. There are always slight problems that sort of tend to complicate things. This week, for example, we ordered chairs that gave us a little trouble. What's the matter? Her feet don't get scrapped. Put one of those little trays under her feet. That might look really ridiculous, but who knows? Yeah, it does. Who needs those? But I think just we have to do something with it because it just, it looks, it, it's a tray, it's not really a footstool. Oh, I know, but we'll see. A lot of times people get more involved in what we've done in the windows than actually looking at it for the clothes. I mean, we do a lot of fun things sometimes, or we show artwork, and they become involved in looking at that, just how we put the window together. And eventually, they also see the merchandise. It's not always they see the dress first. Work, to me, would be another word for creating. It's, it's to take an idea, to see fashion first, and to find an element or a prop that will complement the clothes and sell the clothes. It's almost like a, uh, an extension of advertising. The tray worked. We draped a scarf over it just to soften it a little bit, but it worked perfectly. I think it's a little heavy. Do you? Yeah. Sometimes you're getting involved, you know basically what you're doing, but you don't know whether your boss is going to like or understand what you're doing. 
you don't feel the relief until they tell you it's good. The composition of three girls in the corner looks great. But I think I'm going to run outside real fast. Sure. Just to see how these are looking. Of course you feel great after you've done a good window and you feel like you've produced something that's satisfying to yourself and also satisfying to other people. It's, it's a really good feeling. I'm asked so many times why you become an artist. Well, you become an artist because you don't really have a choice. It's like any profession that you love. But I became an artist at a very early age because of a teacher. He said to me one day, do you know you can make a living doing that and you can have a good time making a living doing that? And it really hadn't occurred to me because I was only in the ninth grade, so who thinks of making a living? Well, he was right. And I went on to an art high school and I went right to work. And I've been working now for about 22 years in the field, freelance and doing my toys. But it's, it's, um, it doesn't seem like work. It is work and you work very hard at it. But it's fun. Sometimes I'm approached to do toys that come from books and Paddington Bear came that way. He was written by a man named Michael Bond in England. I'd start with drawings. I mean, I, I have to make the patterns, but to make a pattern, I usually start with a drawing. And I know in this drawing that I want his nose to be tilted upwards, and I want it to be pretty big, and I want him to have a smile. I look at all the different drawings that have been done in Paddington, and I come up with a composite of who I think he is. Now, Paddington to me is funny, and he's stubborn. I mean, he's always getting in trouble. And he's the kind of bear, you know, you just tell your troubles to. You trust him. You know, you'd love him, and uh, he's that kind of a bear. Once a design is selected, it will become a steel-edged die which will be cut in hundreds of dozens. After a pattern is cut, it goes to the sewing department. They can turn flat pieces of fabric into wonderful fluffy bears. It has its eyes put on, and then it goes on to the stuffing department. You need a nose now. I don't know what to do for your nose. You look pretty good without a nose, but you're going to have to have one. Okay, I don't think it should be a hard one. Hmm. Let's try a black embroidered one. We'll see how that looks. I always think when you're getting your nose embroidered, it might hurt. I forget you're not really real. Okay, well... bigger on both sides. You have a major nose, don't you? Well, that's because you're sort of stubborn looking. Are you stubborn? No, you're not stubborn. You're going to be funny. But you do have a mind of your own. Oh, Paddington, I hope you look good. I hope you look like Paddington. Any bear can look good. But Paddington's going to be special. It's always a mystery. It's like um, taking a ship out into space. 
You send something out there and you really, truly don't know what you can get back. Oh, my two little bears. Oh, you're a nice bear, but you're not Paddington. Don't have any tummy. And you don't have any nose. Well, okay. But you're Paddington, aren't you? Let's see. Yeah, you're pretty good. Okay, you get to wear the tag. Okay, Paddington. Okay. Well, good night, Paddington. I'm going home. Don't go away. Paddington is a very happy bear who gets in a lot of trouble. My name is Mindy Brooks, and I'm a graphic artist, and I work in a small print shop. My work is with books and brochures and menus, business letterheads, advertisements, newsletters, catalogs. What's nice about working here in a small print shop is that I'm exposed to all the different steps that go on to produce a finished product. And many times someone will come in and will have no idea of what they want. And it's up to me to help them to decide what will look best and what will say it best. For instance, Mr. Peterson's newsletter, his camp newsletter, has to appeal to the kids as well as to their parents. And so it has to be eye-catching as well as informative. Okay. So now I'll do a layout. A layout, a rough layout, can all be done in pencil or pen or magic marker. Basically, it is a drawing of what you want to eventually turn into a camera-ready piece of art, into a mechanical. I was never interested in the graphic arts when I was young, probably because I didn't even know about them. But when I was looking through an adult education course brochure and I found a class for beginning mechanicals, it was called. So that's when I first learned about what it takes to put together anything from a newspaper to an advertisement to a book and the process involved. After that, I started working for the newspaper in the advertising paste-up department. A lot of the, the experience that I've gotten in this field has just gradually been picked up, actually. How you doing? Oh, hi. Good. Got you right here. All right. So after the rough layout is okayed and accepted by the customer. So we'll go with that. Mm -hmm. And yep. um, I should have a proof for you in a day or two. We can go ahead and start getting all of the things done. Taking the copy and having it typeset. Taking the photographs and having them changed into half tones. Whenever get a chance. Sometimes today. No problem. And it's putting it all together and coming up with a camera-ready mechanical, a completed version of the layout. In a larger shop, all the jobs might be broken down separately. An art director, a typesetter, and someone just to paste it up into a finished mechanical. Here, being that it's a small shop, I get to do all of that. So I may do all the work up to the mechanical part, getting it ready for the camera. But after that, the camera person takes that, and they shoot that work into a negative. And after that, it goes to the printer, who then takes that negative and burns a plate, which means exposing a piece of metal to light through the negative. And wherever the light hits that metal, it makes it receptive to ink. After it's been burned, he treats it with a chemical. So when you take that plate, which is of a very flexible, thin metal, and put that on the printing press, plate goes around, it picks up the ink, and then it offsets it onto a roller, and then puts it onto the paper. And that's where the term offset printing comes from. So it's very important to have a good relationship with the people that you work with, because they're all important in that finished product that you're trying to put out. The main objective in any part of the graphic arts is that you're putting out a product that you want someone to read 
And you have to catch their eye, get their interest, and hold it so that they will read the information that's there. They will read that message. If someone was interested in going into the graphic arts and they were still in school, I'd probably suggest that they take any art class that they could. If you can look at something and see that it's good and then know why it's good, that's important. You know, everybody has to earn a living at some point. And with design, it's... I guess that the, the pleasure is doing something that you like and that you're good at and getting paid for it. And I think that's right. I think that's what it's all about.